until we can see the Good morning. We're blessed to be here this morning. Uh, I want to ask you, has there ever been a time when circumstances changed in your life requiring the necessity of moving on to a new situation? One time this happened to me, and it was at a at a critical time in life, I had just graduated from college, wasn't real sure what I will, was going to do, and uh, so I started looking for a job, and I interviewed for a job uh, at the Naval y Navy Yard down in southeast Washington, and uh, they were going to hire me uh, to go and uh, live for a while on board ships, studying what the personnel requirements were for each ship. This was in 1964 when this happened. It had happened that about six months before, while I was still in college, I happened to be going through the administration building, and there was a Navy recruiter there. And... Uh, uh, I talked to him for a couple of minutes, and then he suggested to me that I take a uh, test uh, to be a student at uh, the Navy Officer Candidate School. And he said it wouldn't take long, so I took the test, but I never thought I'd ever use it. Huh. And so I went on, I graduated, and it came to this point in the job search that during the intervening six months, the draft had been put into operation. And part of the hiring process was they called my draft board, which is located in Prince George's County, Maryland, here. And they told them, if uh, you hire him, we will have him in within 30 days for a physical. And if he passes that, He'll be in the U.S. Army. I thought about that pretty hard. And I thought the Army wasn't the place for me. I just didn't have those skills. So I went to the Navy. God knew this was going to happen. And there was a lot of good things learned while I was there. But the point here is, there's a lot going on in yours and my life. Sometimes things happen and we have no idea why they happened. They don't seem to be related to anything else. But then later down the road, we find out that they are in fact related. This morning, we're going to take a look at the uh, 17th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 10 through 15. Here, we see uh, the scripture open up with uh, telling us about the, pro the process and progress of Paul and Silas's missionary journeys uh, to Greece. And uh, they have been, for a short time, in the city of Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the capital, basically, of uh, Macedonia, northern part of Greece. It was a big city, a lot of commerce, etc. And uh, uh, Paul and Silas had spent some time at the Jewish synagogue located there. 
preach the gospel. And some responded, but others reacted in a way that threatened their lives. And one of the beautiful things here we see as this part of the mission begins is the love of some brothers in Thessalonica that escort Paul and Silas to a, a city known as Berea. Berea was about 50 miles to the west of Thessalonica. And that's where we pick up the story. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night into Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. What we see here is a practice that Paul had made in terms of his missionary journeys. He looked for the synagogue in the cities that he went to. And he found a synagogue here. And he, he always went to the Jewish people first when he into a, went into a new area. So uh, he had been, uh, now the first place in Greece that he went to was Philippi. There was not a synagogue there, but Jewish custom was until there are 10 Jewish men, a synagogue would not be formed, but those that would come would meet usually by riverside for a place of prayer. And so the Sabbath, uh, Paul and Silas went down to the river and they found a group. And that led to uh, souls being one in Philippi. But in Thessalonica, there was a synagogue there. And he stayed there for several weeks. And now we see him moving on to Berea, where there is a functioning uh, synagogue. And we see here the, what the uh, scripture has to uh, tell us about this uh, synagogue, uh, that these people were more noble than the Thessalonians were. And within that, we see the contrast here of the two places of ministry. First of all, them being more noble has the sense of being open-minded, alert, not threatened by other things, but self-confident in a wholesome way, not in a selfish way. And contrasted with, they had just come away from a place filled with uh, people making mobs to attack them and to go after them. So here's the contrast. We're coming to a place where they're going to be received rather than attacked by some of the people that are there. Uh, we learn some things in the 11th verse that describe and kind of flesh out them being noble. It says that they were noble-minded, more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. These are some of the characteristics that made them noble. They received the word. They were open to it. They listened to it. They thought about it. They were also filled with great eagerness. They had a keen desire to get into God's word. And I hope that's the desire you came with this morning. A keen desire to hear from God speaking in his word to us together. We're all, we also learned that they were examining the scriptures. They were looking carefully at them. They inspected them. They scrutinized them. But something I think it's important for you to know at this point, this would have been about 50, 51 A.D. Just to give you a little chronology here, Jesus was crucified somewhere at about 
30 to 32 AD. So this is about 20 years later, roughly. There had only been, I believe, one New Testament book written at that time. It's the book of James. The book of Galatians was written somewhere close to this time, but that's it. So the scriptures that they were examining were the Old Testament. How often do you read the Old Testament? Can you find Jesus in the Old Testament? Paul used that. The Jewish people, this congregation, was filled with people that God was touching through the scripture, even though they had not apparently been saved yet. I would characterize them as the remnant of Judaism, dispersed into the world, but still open. A lot of the remnant is not open at this point. But we see they were looking at the scriptures daily. And I want to encourage you, open your Bible every day. Live in it. You've got to know it to recognize what God is doing and what he's doing particularly in your life and in the lives around you. And it is not a waste of time. That's something that um, the Lord has led me to do. Um, and... Uh, it has been a blessing. And we're also told that what they did was they looked at the scripture to see if the things were so in the scripture. They were looking for truth. How many people that you meet today are looking for truth? Not many. Thank you, David. I agree with you, unfortunately. And sometimes the truth they're looking for is not pure truth. It's been tampered with. It's not clear. But it's the time we live in, and we need to be aware of that. Um, they were daily looking at the Scripture, and Paul was spending time with them. Uh, this is a good point to suggest to you in terms of studying uh, a beautiful and uh, uh, believer that's written an excellent book on the Bible. Is, his name is Max Anders. He gives a couple hints that Bible study should revolve around. First of all is observation. Whatever you're reading, observe what's in it. And by observation is meant what does it say? Be careful to look. What does it say? The second thing is interpretation of it. What does the passage mean? What does it say? What does it mean? And then the third step is application. What does it mean to me? What does it say? What does it mean? Could be just a, a general principle. And then finally, what does it mean to me? These folks had the Old Testament because they were, they were studying it, and that was a blessing. We have the full scripture today, and we need to be found faithful in terms of uh, studying it, growing from it, learning from it. We've got a number of very fine Bible students here. And please, and I open myself up to you, if there's anything I can do to help you uh, learn to study the scripture, and I know all the elders feel that way, and uh, uh, we want to do that. And this should be part of discipling new believers when we're in contact with them. 
In the 12th verse, we see here a consequence of this activity that the Bereans were involved in. It says, therefore, and that's the key, therefore, relates it back to what has just gone before. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. So, we see that their study had an impact and a blessed impact. They were more noble because they had become ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Being noble is part of being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. We see that they welcomed the word. That's what the word receive means before. They wanted the word. There was a real need, just like a couple times every day, most of us want food. There should be that kind of walk, want within our spirit. And they walk with the word, examining, using it, applying it in everyday life. It comes alive. It's not supposed to be something we just close. Well, we'll put it on the shelf till next uh, Sunday. Or have you ever been in a house with a beautiful Bible on the table in the living room? And you can tell that it's probably never been opened. It's just decoration. That's not why it's been given to us. We need to examine it, to study it, to be blessed by it, to be able to live by it. And they, they did it daily, periodically. There should be a time in all of our lives each day that we spend some time with the Lord. One listening to what he has to say to us and for us. I was blessed this morning. Charlie sent me a text early this morning. And uh, it was very helpful to me. It got me ready for this morning. I saw and felt the Lord speaking. And... uh, Charlie does this a lot, and it's a, it's a real blessing to share the word. And one of the ways the Lord often leads us. And uh, so they were uh, uh, daily in the word, and they had worked the word to validate it. They knew it was true. Uh, if, we t- if we took a survey... In, in any city, just about any large city particularly, um, you'd find a lot of people that they don't give any validity at all to the Word of God. They know it's a nice book that sometimes you encounter in church, but that's it. This is our Creator's book. It has everything we need to know at this place in life. And it introduces us to him and shows us what he has done for us. And it is essential for having a happy life. Now, I can kind of pull rank on most of you because I'm older than you guys are. But it is absolutely true. It kind of works a little bit like the uh, vitamin B works in our bodies. Vitamin B, I understand, I'm not a doctor, but I understand that there's uh, eight components to it. And uh, basically what the purpose of is it helps uh, to keep our body well-oiled to function through the day. They help converting food into fuel, giving us the energy throughout the day. God's Word gives us the energy for the day and is preparing us for the future. 
and it's worth the time for you to spend doing that. What else do we see here as a consequence? We see that many believed. The short term for that is we're saved. And uh, we see a, a contrast here that uh, the term is many if earlier in the chapter talking about the response of the Thessalonians, it says some of them were persuaded of the Jews. But here we see many of the Jews are persuaded. Think back of the Jewish reaction to Jesus when he was alive. Started off with big crowds and as the ministry over a three year period of time went on, it filtered down to less and less and less. Then there was a, a, uh, a Sabbath when uh, he was given a big parade, Palm Sunday or Sabbath. And then less than seven days later, they nailed him to a tree. They executed him. After Pentecost, we see many Jews responding. And some of the Jews, when you look at the accounts in Acts 2, uh, they were Jewish people from all over the known world at that time that were in Jerusalem for that feast. And many of them came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Also here, it tells us that a number of prominent Greek women and men were there. To me, that is really inspiring. And one of the reasons is that when you look at the Old Testament, there was only one prophet that went to a foreign nation. That was Jonah. He went to reach a foreign nation. Yes, you're right. Daniel went, was deported. Jonah went. He was called to go. And he went to Assyria. And uh, after, of course, being trying to escape, go probably to Spain, uh, the Lord gave a storm to affect the ship, and then he's thrown overboard and swallowed by a huge fish for a couple of days, and then he's put back. Then he decides he's going to follow the Lord's direction and go to Assyria. He goes there. He preaches. And there's a tremendous response. They come to the Lord. And then what does he do? Does he thank the Lord? Nope. He gets angry that they responded. So here what we see is a blessed thing that's happening in this sanctuary. They have accepted Gentiles, and there are Gentiles there. Most of us are Gentiles. And they're doing what we saw almost none being done in the Old Testament. They're reaching out. And we see that a number of the prominent Greek women and men were saved. Now, in verse 13 here, it starts off with the word but. But is a key here. There's a, there's a change here, a contrast coming. And we see, but when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed in Paul, by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Spiritual warfare. Have you seen spiritual warfare? It can be really ugly. Churches that are trying to be faithful to God's word and will will see it. It's unfortunate. 
But here, in this case, we see people that completely rejected God's word, God's prophet here, Paul. And they not only rejected it, they attempted to stamp it out. Contemplating physical harm to those bearing testimony. But isn't it amazing that after experiences like that, Paul and Silas and Timothy kept going on? And one of those factors I'm absolutely convinced of is the love that God had planted in their hearts. Even if someone you witness to rejects, don't get angry with them. Pray for them. Look to see them saved. We should never rejoice in someone dying or something happens so they'll be eternally separated from God. We should have his love, the love that we see in Jesus on the cross. You know, I would during the Bible study this morning, and thank you, Paul, the it kept going on over and over again how God loves us so much that even when we foul up and we're not doing what we ought to be doing, He still loves us and He lifts up to His promises. Where else can you find someone that keeps promises like the Lord? For a while, I was in a profession that's primarily founded on people not keeping promises, law. And we see that over and over again. We see that in commercial life, et cetera, politicians. Although we've gotten to the point with politicians, we think that's normal. Um, No, we should be people of integrity. And so what we see as the ministry is at a place to be continued somewhere else, we see ambassadors of Jesus Christ versus the Antichrist, the Jews in Thessalonica that rejected him. This is our role today, that we should not be deterred from the Great Commission. God has placed us here for, uh, to reach the people here on Kent Island, in St. Johnsbury, in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, there's some work that I believe he wants us to do in India also. God is expanding what he wants to do through this church. And I believe that's what, uh, what he wanted to do in the Berean church. They wanted to live the word that had been proclaimed to them from the Old Testament. That Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one who paid the price for my sin and your sin. And that he wants us to share and be a witness to what God had done. That's a big part of what we see in the New Testament Paul doing. Paul was a witness. He had opposed, he had been with a group of Jews that were trying to put a, do away with Christianity. But God met him. And he couldn't deny it. And he responded. And think, of what you know through the New Testament, all the letters that he wrote. And incidentally, uh, after Galatians, but within a year or two of when he was in Thessalonica, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians, letters to that church. 
encouraging them to grow in grace, helping them to deal with false doctrines. He even talks a little bit about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He loved the church. He wasn't turned off by the persecution. But part of the change that, that I think is really important, and I believe it absolutely happens in our day and time, and that is what the Antichrist, the critics tried to do, those that opposed the gospel, they moved Paul in response, loving brothers, moved him to the next place. Was that really what Satan wanted done? No. But God's able to take what he does and turn it into good. And that's exactly what happens. And what I want to encourage you all to do as you live daily life, look for what God's doing in you, through you, around you. Don't close the doors. Sometimes there'll be a surprise. Rebel and I are here. We came to a high school graduation party at the clubhouse at Queen's Landing here on the island from a friend. It was a young lady that was a friend of ours. We went to the party. And that afternoon, we found our house. We weren't looking for our house here. We had looked a year before. Didn't think it was going to work. But we found a house. That's all we knew of God's program at that point. Wondered whether it would work to buy the house, but it did. And he brought us here. And then when the time was right, through a 7-Eleven clerk on the island here, we found out about the bridge. One Sunday morning, the clerk told me, we went in for coffee, we were going back to the church we had been to before on the other side. And the clerk said to me, I'm going to church today. I said, oh, where are you going? He said, I don't know, but the pastor's coming to get me this morning. So Monday morning, I asked him, and we heard about the bridge. That's how we found here. And then God has opened the door. He'll do that in your life and in our lives together. Some things more individual and some things the whole bunch of us together. But think about what he's laid out ahead of us here the mission points here, Kent Island and Queen Anne's County, etc., St. Johnsbury, Uganda, and we don't know where else, and, and possibly some work in India, etc. The God of Creator is calling us to do it. When I was a kid growing up, we used to read and hear about the missionaries. But unless they actually came on a visit, we never saw them. We supported them through the offering. Here, God's, God's opened it up. We see them. We know them. Our brothers and sisters in St. Johnsbury, we're working with, getting to know. And what a blessing that is, that he's given to us. And I hope you look forward to what God is doing. It was time for God to move Paul on, and Paul goes to Athens. And actually, Greece was at this time divided in two sectors. Macedonia was the north, and the south was Achaia. And Athens was there, and so was the other large city, Corinth. And so the mission plan continued uh, that God had for them. And uh, uh, Paul was taken down. The scriptures tell us 
that after he got there, he sent some messages back on up to uh, Timothy and to Silas. Silas and Timothy apparently stayed at the Berean church after Paul left, and they discipled and helped them grow. Uh, later on, Timothy would become the pastor of the church at Ephesus. They were growing, and uh, they were being faithful. I pray that we will be a Berean church. And I hope you agree to that. A Berean church is a church that welcomes the word. We have a pastor that has a gift to teach, preach, explain God's word. We should want the word. We should be eager for it. God's direction, his love, his care in our lives. What he's doing. And to walk the word. Examine it. Use it. Put it into practice. Make decisions using it. And then to work the word, to validate it, show it. There are lots of discussions uh, in everyday life you'll see. And if you're alert, you'll see sometimes people just obviously don't understand this, what the scripture's saying. But a lot of people dismiss it on that kind of basis without really understanding what God's word says. It's our privilege to share the word. We're all per that have been saved are personal witnesses. We're supposed to be obedient disciples. And the obedience makes it possible to see the things God has in store for us. One of the things that has been in the background of this study for me has simply been, and God's been working this into me, too often we're too, pro, we're too preoccupied with what we know. Often the beauty is in what we don't know. And that's God. There's more of him than we know. He's infinite. He'll never die. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And he loves us. And he's done what we absolutely had need of. Have our sins forgiven. To be born again. To grow as his child. And point in the Bible, uh, the uh, Bible study this morning, I think that uh, uh, the, our brothers and sisters in St. Johnsbury are also using the same material we are. Remember there the gift, the biggest gift of all is him. He is given to each one of us. How important that is. How important. And discipleship is a be beautiful thing. We're being made like Jesus. I've recently come to, to think about my age. I'm going to pull age on you again. Uh, a little bit. As I get older, and there are a lot of folks my age and older that this doesn't happen to, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm getting happier every day. I'm happier every day because it's a day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. And I think that's the way life should be for us. There are difficulties we have to go through, but it is a blessing. And within the security of knowing that he, we are his, and he's looking out for us, life 
should be a blessing to us. I want you to join me in a word, word of prayer at this point. Heavenly Father, thank you for recording Paul's stay, sharing the gospel with the Bereans, and for their response. And the response we see at other missions. Father, thank you for giving us the privilege of participating in your work, reaching the lost. Ken Island, St. Johnsbury, Kampala, Uganda, and throughout the world. Father, we ask that you would help us to see clearly what you want each one of us to do, to study diligently your word and share it, and to look for the opportunities that you give us each day to introduce another to Jesus Christ. Help us to keep our vision on you continually and look for your will in daily life that our lives may bring glory to you and your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the...